So, so far when discussing uh, botnet communication protocols, I talked about using both IRC and HTTP. Uh, what I'd like to do now is talk about a third option, namely peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, now, now, before proceeding, I do want to make one important distinction on nomenclature, and that is that you know, IRC and HTTP both refer to specific protocols, whereas peer-to-peer -peer really refers to uh, a broader class of protocols, not just a specific protocol. Uh, and there are many examples of peer-to-peer of -peer protocols. So when I talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, I don't mean it the same way as I do, uh, let's say, HTTP or IRC, but rather I'm using that term to, to loosely describe any peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So for example, Overnet, a uh, common example of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and, and in fact this one was used uh, inside of a bot called Storm. Um, and it's one example of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Now, uh, I think I'll do this video series kind of similar to ones I've done in the past, where in this video I'll focus more on kind of the history of peer-to-peer -peer and kind of how it plays a role in botnet communication. And then in the next video, I'll talk more about the mechanics of a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. So first of all, peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols, and this particular class of protocols, it's really the same that, that people have been using for quite some time to download music and movies. And peer-to-peer and -peer protocols became very popular with offerings like uh, Napster. I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard of Napster. Uh, uh, although Napster, I think, technically had a uh, had files that were indexed on a central server, so it was not fully decentralized or fully peer-to-peer, -peer, but it, it did, did employ uh, a lot of the, the distribution happen over a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, b besides Napster, I mean, I think Napster was sort of the first in its class of peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Uh, another a bunch of other actual protocols uh, emerged after Napster. Uh, one of the more common ones is, is Nutella. And these were actually all kind of benign protocols, so to speak. I guess it depends on what you mean by nine, benign, but they weren't designed for botnets and, and that sort of thing. They were designed for sharing files, sharing music, uh, sharing movies, etc. Now, it is important to keep in mind that the peer-to-peer -peer protocols in and of themselves aren't inherently malicious. They're just protocols designed for, for moving traffic around the internet without having to do a, use a centralized server to do so. And so as a result, there has been a lot of academic research on peer-to-peer -peer protocols. So for example, there are protocols like CORD uh, and another protocol called uh, Kademlia. Kademlia. And CORD and Kademlia are basically uh, protocols that were developed by the academic community. They use uh, distributed hash tables or DHTs. Um, and I'll kind of write that out, distributed hash tables. Distributed hash tables. And uh, these, these are basically used for facilitation of, of finding information in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So they kind of help you to find out where information might be stored on that network. Okay, so, so now that I've kind of talked about what peer-to-peer -peer is and the history of peer-to-peer -to, -peer to a very high level, let me talk a bit about why peer-to-peer -peer protocols are used in the context of botnets. So for starters, you know, while many kind of old school botnets are still common, the one challenge that they all had is they kind of had a single point of failure. So let's say if you had a bunch of, of nodes, and again, let's mark these as, as red to show that they're compromised. Uh, and let's say these nodes were part of a botnet. And in the traditional model, what would happen is these nodes would then communicate with a command and control server. So let's say here's a command and control server. And this might be, let's say, an IRC server, or it could be a web server. And the issue becomes that if you're able, if you're a security researcher, if you're trying to deal with this, the possibility that these guys are infected with this particular botnet and are being controlled by the CNC server, if you're able to take down the CNC server, let's say you're able to take it offline, then these bots are effectively just let free. And there, there's nothing, as soon as the CNC server is taken offline, the bot master loses control over his botnet. And that's, that's just true not only if you take the server down, but if you just somehow manage to inhibit its ability to talk to the bots under its control, you really debilitate the entire botnet full stop. And, and as most bot masters are, are really profit driven, that could be a very serious issue for them. So that they, they you know, definitely don't want that to happen. So one benefit, and this is really a benefit from the perspective of a bot master, one benefit of a peer-to-peer -peer approach is that instead of having a single point of failure, instead of having a single central CNC server, what you would have instead are bots that basically just communicate with each other. Um, and each of them kind of functions uh, as its own CNC server. And I'm, I'm going to kind of draw this out in some maybe more realistic fashion, but you can imagine there's, you know, let's say a cluster of bots here, maybe some bots here, 
etc. So these bots can kind of communicate with each other, you know, via uh, they can communicate with each other and maybe get information and updates from each other rather than having a centralized mechanism to go towards. And, and so as a result, uh, there's no more single point of failure, right? The, the idea is that you take down, let's say you take down this node in the CNC, you're able to get rid of it. Well, these other nodes still kind of continue to exist. Every single node functions as both a client and a server. It, it's a CNC and a bot infected host kind of built into one. So you don't have that issue of, of one node kind of being responsible for the, the weight of the entire network from a, from a reliability and robustness perspective. Now the drawback of this type of architecture is that bot masters really no longer have that direct line of communication with their bots. If you think about the centralized model, a bot master issues a command here and everyone gets it. Uh, if you have a peer-to-peer -peer model, uh, commands are gonna be propagated across the network and it might take a long time for a single command that's been kind of inserted at one node to really propagate its way to all of the other nodes in the network, and that basically increases latency. So there's an increase in latency. And that matters for some applications of, uh, of botnet. So for example, if you're using your botnet to mount a denial of service attack, being able to kind of coordinate a bunch of systems at once is a very critical aspect of being able to mount a successful denial of service attack. If, on the other hand, you're trying to do something different, I don't know, uh, like fast flux or, or, or sending out spam, you may not need that level of coordination. And so for certain aspects, certain applications of, of botnets, latency is a big issue. For others, it's not. Uh, on the flip side, you do get that improved reliability, so to speak, or, or, or uh, no single points of failure. So no single points of failure. Which is, again, very critical from the perspective of the bot master who is using their botnet to make money. I do want to mention before closing a couple of examples of, uh, of common peer-to-peer -peer botnets. So I mentioned Storm, and that's one, certainly one of the more popular ones. There were a number that kind of came before it. Uh, so one of the first peer-to-peer -peer botnets that was seen in the wild was Synit, uh, also known as Calypso. And I believe that was seen around uh, 90 or 2003, rather. Uh, I think there were maybe a couple of examples before that one, but that's, that's one of the ones that that kind of gets cited as one of the early examples of a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. Some Agabot variants had peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. And I talked about Agabot in an earlier video, and that was one of the first kind of popular IRC botnets. Some of its variants had some peer-to-peer -peer capabilities. Uh, Fatbot, which is spelled P-H-A-T, Fatbot, was in many ways marked an inflection point in the design of peer-to-peer -peer botnets. It was really far more holistic in terms of being really peer-to-peer -peer in, in a truer sense. And then you had obviously Storm and PCOM and others that, that kind of have now really marked the era of peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnets. So I'm going to stop this video right here. In the next video, I will talk about the mechanics of peer-to-peer -peer botnets.